Morning guys, <laughs> Dr. Ken Norbert here uh, with another deer hunting seminar for you. I think you're going to really like this one. Uh, you know, we've gone through all kinds of information about deer signs and how to identify deer from their signs, you know, sexes and sizes of bucks and all kinds of ways to do it. So you've learned a lot about whitetails about their signs. You've also learned a lot about their habits and behavior during hunting season. Things they do and don't do and the way they react to what you're doing when you're out there hunting, that kind of thing. Well now, what I'm going to do for a while is put these all this information together in a way that will kind of get you used to using this kind of information to hunt older bucks. And I'm going to take individual bucks I've taken and some of my boys have taken uh, in the future and we're going to go through the whole program with each deer, you know, how to hunt a big buck successfully. And so we're going to take one here. I, the one I decided to start with was a buck I took a few years ago. Oh, it's getting to be quite a few already. Uh, I, it was kind of an exciting hunt. It was, it was a bunch of work, but it was exciting. And 15 minutes after I took this buck, my grandson, Tyler, took a trophy class buck. Huge thing, I had well over 300 pounds. I, it was such a job to get his out of the woods. And, uh, so we got two big bucks that morning and and piled them onto one of my my yard wagons that I use for gardening. My other passion in life is gardening. And we got those two big bucks on there and hauled them well over a mile to camp. And uh, that was about, yeah, just imagine over a quarter ton of venison on that one wagon. Well, anyway, so we're going to start putting this information together, and uh, I think a lot of you guys have been looking forward to it. You've, I've gotten letters from hunters saying, I wish you'd talk about hunting individual bucks that you've taken, you know, go through that whole process. So that's what I'm going to do. Now one of the things about hunting big bucks, it seems like every hunt, uh, you know, that I, well, I've been successful at taking a buck has been different different in different ways. And it's partly our fault that it should be that way. You know, we, you know, for 35, you just imagine, for 35 years now, we've been hunting whitetails from tree stands. And whitetails are really adaptable animals, and most notably older bucks. Boy, are they adaptable. They're so good at at discovering and identifying and avoiding hunters and tree stands that's gotten to the point where a lot of hunters believe there just aren't any or very few older bucks in the areas they hunt. Now something's got to be done to increase the number of older bucks. When in actuality there's hardly a square mile of suitable habitat anywhere in America that, that doesn't have the usual number of older bucks in it. And the reason you're not seeing them because they've gotten to be really good at avoiding hunters and tree stamps. It's not like back in the mid 80s. Well, even before that, I started using tree stands in the early 1960s. They weren't really what you would call a tree stand. They were just a little platform, a few uh, heavy branches cut into short lengths and nailed between branches six feet above the ground. And I could sit up there with my feet dangling and have deer walking right under me and all around. I could put it up in a bed and the deer would come there and lay down all around me and chew their cuds and never look up there. And we used to think back in those days, well, they must not smell you either if you're up off the ground. And I remember the early advertising for tree stands back in those days. They would have a guy up there and they'd be, have something that producing smoke and the smoke would go parallel to the ground. So, well, this that's why they can't smell you up there. Well, since then we've, you know, 
Uh, we've learned a lot about that. That just isn't true. <laughs> I, but finding out it wasn't true um, was uh, proven by some bears. Uh, we shot bears a lot too. We still hunt them now and then, black bears. But I remember my boys, they're all anxious to get their first bear. And we did a lot of bear hunting uh, years ago. And one day when my son Dave was sitting up in a, in a tree stand, uh, bear hunting, his tree started to shudder and he was wondering what's going on and looks down and here's a bear climbing, about a 250 pound bear, climbing up the tree to where his tree stand was. And, <laughs> and he didn't know, quite know what to do about it. It got up to the platform level. One day, we, the way we built our stands back in those days, we had a seat, we had railings around it, you know, and sit there comfortably. And the, one of the baits we always used was honey, and Dave had a half a jar of honey sitting on the platform underneath his seat. And that bear came up there and reached for that jar of honey. And then he looked up and saw Dave with his head net on and looking down. <laughs> and then they looked at each other for a few minutes and the bear decided, well, I think I better go right on in here and climb down the tree and disappear. So what that bear told us that day, they can smell things up in trees. They smelt the honey up there. You know, and I think it was a week later I, tied, I put sausages uh, little sizzlers in little mesh bags in trees, tied them in little bags, put them up in trees, uh, up as high as 30 feet above the ground, in different places around the woods. And we went back the next week. There were bear claws uh, markings in every one of those trees. It didn't matter how high you put it, the bears would smell them up there and go up there and get them. And so, if bears could smell anything in trees, whitetails can smell anything in trees. In those early days, they smelled us all right, but back then they were used to seeing hunters only on the ground. There, there was no tree stand, you know, tree stand hunting didn't really take off until 1985 when portable stands came out and also doe and estrus type lure sense. And of course, back in those days, my goodness, and you, you, most of you probably don't remember those days. You know, mid, uh, 1980s, you, you probably weren't even born, a lot of you then. But anyway, you get a portable tree stand, put it in a tree, and then get doe and estrus lure sense, put it down there one way or another along this trail in the woods, you know, deer trail. And it practically guaranteed that you're going to get a deer and and probably a buck and and maybe even a big one for the wall. I mean, it, it made bow hunting, you know, the tree stands and lure set made made hunting really easy then. Well, 35 years later, it ain't working that way anymore because whitetails are really adaptable. They They've gotten to be really good, especially older bucks gotten to be, you know, older bucks don't get to be older because they're dumb. They get to be older because they're very intelligent, they're very cunning. They really pay attention to things like human sense. And they've gotten to be so good at avoiding people in tree stands. A lot of tree stands are used to seeing a lot of deer earlier in the year, earlier years. Well, there's no more big bucks in this area. You don't see them anymore. Well, that's just not true. They're there, but they're so used to uh, dealing with hunters in tree stands nowadays that uh, a tree stand hardly, hardly ever sees them anymore. In fact, they find most tree stand hunters nowadays within their first four hours, first half day, a hunter uses a tree stand, and then they avoid them for the rest of the hunting season there. And so you, if you, I don't care what you're using for bait, whether you're using rattling antlers or grunt calls or, or a food plot, you know, you can have turnips and clover and everything and alfalfa and all that kind of stuff out there. Once the buck finds you there, he's going to avoid you. It doesn't matter what you got there, what you're using for a lure set. Well, that's what's going on today. So we've made him that way. 35 years of stand hunting has made our bucks that way. And nowadays, you can't just hunt them one way 
and sit in one tree stand for a whole hind set season and expect you're going to take big bucks every year. Nowadays, you got to be versatile. You got to adapt as well. You got to take all the knowledge you do, all the whitetail lore you've learned, truthful stuff, and that's the only kind you get for money is truthful whitetail lore. No monkey business about them. You take that and a really good knowledge of your hunting area, which comes from good scouting. You know, you got to scout to become really knowledgeable about the area hunt. You put those things together and then don't tie yourself to one stand site for a whole hunting season. That we've gotten to the point, you know, we went gradually from one for years, really just one, each guy in camp had one, and then pretty soon each one of us had three tree stands to use. And now we change stand sites every half day, beginning on day three of a hunting season. The, the, the opening weekend, we pick out stands for opening weekend two or more weeks before the season begins and, there, and get things ready then and don't come back until opening day, opening morning. We, we don't come back. We, we have no sense, nothing there in the woods to, to tip off big bucks that this is a dangerous place. The first time they find us, which most time we don't really, you know, they, they find us much more often than we see, actually see them, you know. But most of this happens without us realizing that the bucks have found us and now they're avoiding us. But nowadays, if, you know, if you sit in a tree stand, oh, let's say two half days in a row, maybe three or four, and don't see the buck there that you were hoping to get. It means only one thing, he knows you're there and he's avoiding you. So nowadays you got to be versatile, so you put all these things together. So let's, now, let, let's say you're joining us in deer camp, you're in the Nordberg deer camp, and you're going to stick with me for the day, and I'm going to teach you something about buck hunting today. And so the alarm goes off at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you moan and go, you guys are crazy. What are you doing getting up at this early for? I don't want to go out in the woods until I can see where I'm going. You know, you're going to want to stumble around out there in the dark and you're going to chase them away. I want to be able to at least see the deer when I get out there and maybe get a shot or two at the deer running away, you know. That's crazy. Well, yeah, it's crazy if you don't know how to do it right. Yeah, if you don't know... The, about the precautions you got to take in order to hunt big bucks nowadays. Yeah, of course it's not going to work if you if you don't know how to do it properly. You know, you you can. I've got six six fair chase stand hunting methods I'm teaching you. You know, and uh, we use different ones depending on the circumstances in different places every half day. You know. So that's what you got to be able to do. You got you got to become adaptable and versatile, and learn how to put all this information together. So in the morning we get up in deer camp. I don't care what the what the, the weather forecast was the evening before. We always listen to them before we go to bed in the evening, so we kind of have an idea where we're going to hunt in the morning. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but get up in the morning, the first thing, you know, when I get up, I get the coffee water going, get the fire going, our big two-barrel um, uh, wood stove in the tent. It gets nice warmed up, you know, in a matter of 10 minutes or so. Everybody's finally getting up, and by this time I've been outside and I come in, and uh, they ask me, what direction is the wind direction today? Where, where's the wind blowing? And you know when I get a fire going in there and there's smoke coming out of the chimney and I come in and put a shit flashlight and there it is blowing in that direction, you know. So I come in, like this particular morning, the wind was blowing from the south. And there were guys say, oh geez, that's the wrong one for where I want to go today. And the way it was for me too, but I figured I was going to have to do something and actually it was just right. Now, let's talk about, it. now, earlier, you know, weeks earlier when we were doing our serious scouting, I went to this trail, I've known, you know, we've been hunting in this area for 30 years, and I've known this trail, it's a deer trail going through the woods here, 
has been there's all these crown scrapes made by, by big bucks along that and antler ropes, always on this thing. Over here is a great big hill. That's actually more than a square mile in size. This hill is pretty high up on top. And big bucks like big high hills. <laughs> they like to bed near the top of high hills. Not all of them, but where you got them. This one has been a favorite of big bucks for years, this big hill here. There's no water there. And one of their closest sources of water is this beaver pond over here. And so they use this trail a lot to go there to get water. Another trail that you commonly use is this one up here, this little black line I've got here, kind of goes this way and that way. That's actually several deer trails, kind of connecting deer trails. No matter one year, my son Dave put a trail cam on that trail. And he photographed seven different bucks, you know, various ages from yearlings to a big dominant breeding buck. Using that, oh, he was so excited about it. He didn't even want to tell us what he did. But he put a tree stand up near one end and a tree stand at the other end. So he'd have some, he'd be able to hunt there no matter what the wind direction. I always have a crosswind or he'd be in a downwind uh, position. Well, I didn't get any. <laughs> And <coughs> that year, excuse me, four of the bucks that he photographed were taken by other hunters in other areas. Some of them on this big hill, some of them over in this area, up to a mile away. Yeah. Kind of learned a lesson. You can't depend on it, on pictures you get with a trail cam for when you're hunting big bucks. If you go with that alone, chances are most time it isn't going to work out. But anyway. Uh, this one, I had scouted that earlier, a couple of weeks earlier. And as usual, there were ground scrapes. That was in October, you know, in the last half of October was when 90% of ground scrapes and antler rubs are made along this trail. And it was commonly used by different bucks from this big hill, big hill over there. And usually it was at least five mature bucks, the kind that us Norbergs find it hard to pass up. Uh, in some years when it's lean and things aren't working well, a two and a half year old buck might look pretty good, especially if it's an eight pointer, or some of them are, and with, a, with a decent spread. But most of the time we stick to three and a half to six and a half year old bucks. And like last year, three of the bucks we took were three and a half year olds, and one was a four and a half. Because deer population was really low last year. But anyway, well, the number of bucks would use this trail going back and forth there, and the big dominant buck, he wanted to make sure all the bucks who used that trail knew he was around here. You know, he had his, his antler up and ground scrapes that he renewed regularly during those two to three weeks before breeding began. But usually when we hunt there, I know we're in November, breeding is in progress. And big bucks just don't have a lot of time to be renewing ground scrapes. In fact, they may not renew any of them during that period, except under specific circumstances. But nonetheless, that trail looked awfully good to me because these bucks over here were using a lot to go get water. And then they have to drink water at least twice a day. And so, I thought, oh, I got to hunt this sometime this season. And that one morning, I said, you know, I think there's a day I'm going to go hunt this place, this trail. And what I had in mind, a place to sit. You see right here, this is a highland here, makes timber. But out here is a great big, long, bare, rocky outcrop. And it's bare rock, white granite. The whole length, big, long length here. From here to here is about three quarter of a mile. That's a, this is a huge thing here. You know, it's over a quarter mile long, this big bare granite. Boy, you can tiptoe across that in the dark without making any noise at all. And I was going to sit on this end of it, right there at the end <coughs> is a red oak tree. And red oaks hold their leaves all winter. And the leaves are down about this high above the ground. And I, I can get right up underneath that thing with my back to the trunk 
And there were branches sticking out, dead ones before. One I was counting, I cut those lower branches off. And in front of it was a bunch of, of Mount Naples. Oh, they were all about this tall and some hazels, about that tall. So I could sit in front of that trunk and I would be well masked by all these smaller woody shrubs growing in front of there. And I could sit there and just, only my head was clear, you know, if, where you, you get your rifle off, that's fine. I got clear opening to this trail going along the edge of this highland here. Down below here is the elder swamp, just like a, a low, low valley there full of elders here. Uh, down below here. So this is a favorite trail. And uh, so I thought, well, I am going to water today there. And that, well, this takes a while to freeze over. And if it does freeze, then they get in the stream where the water is running and get fresh water there. They'd rather eat, have fresh water than eat snow in the winter, but they'll get along on eating snow when it gets really cold. But anyway, so I, that's where I wanted to be. And a south wind, see the wind blowing from the south, would be a good one. But to take advantage of that, I was going to have to do some tremendous hiking. Now, our camp is down here, actually be, actually be down here, but it'd be a mile, about a mile from here to there where that trail crosses, this old logging trail, and all kind of brushy along the edges. But, so about a mile from here, and, and beyond that, I was going to go way up here and take to Deer Trail, this Deer Trail going here, and it curves around like that and gets over into this area. And uh, so it's a long way, and then come back to that, way around like that. But this part here, I'd be coming into the wind. I'd be facing the wind coming in. Once I turn the corner up here, then I'd be in, going into the wind the whole way, and that's what I wanted to do. I have to do it really carefully. So that way, that morning I started out. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out, you know, when I'm walking in the dark, I started out at about 5 o'clock in the morning here from the camp. Pitch dark. And uh, anyway, and it was mostly cloudy that morning, I remember. A light breeze from the south. I don't go out there with a great big flashlight, you know, a big lantern that shined all over the country. I carry a small little lanterns. My, my favorite flashlight is about six inches long and maybe an inch and a quarter diameter. And that's my favorite flashlight. And you can have a wide beam or a narrow stabbing little uh, bright beam uh, by adjusting the front part of it. But that's my favorite flashlight for getting around in the dark. Because I don't have a big wide beam that's going to be shining all over the country. Gee, a deer can see that thing. You point one in their direction a mile away. And even in the woods, they'll see flashes of it coming and shining on tree trunks. And that. You don't want that to be happening. So when you're going off in it like this, this first part is a pretty straight walk until I get up to this point. But it's a long way. I have to get an early start. But walk steady, no stopping, you know, you might, there might be deer all along the edge and you don't want to alarm any and have any of them start snorting and carrying on or bounding away. As long as you keep moving, keep your head pointed straight ahead, you don't have to, you just don't rush, just walk at a moderate pace, just keep going. Lots of deer along the way might see you and identify you, but they aren't going to be bounding and snorting away from that point and alarm all the deer in the area. Why don't you keep walking in that direction? So my flashlight, I keep my flashlight pointed at the ground no further than about 20 feet ahead, but always downward. No flash of light going through the woods. Always pointed downward ahead of me like this. And I'm always interested in the kind of tracks I'm, I'm going to see along the way. I know I'm going to see deer tracks when they cross the road, and they even feed along the edge of that old road. There's a lot of browse growing there along that road, and so they'll feed along the edge there. So anyway, I, I, when I took off, I remember when I hit that thing here. Now, you know, I didn't want it. There were fresh tracks there, and some of them looked big, and they had gone that way. More than one deer. There were several deer had crossed here when I went. I didn't want to stop and look at that. They might be standing right there watching me. 
No, you just keep going, keep going, keep going. So someday you're gonna, you know, someday you're gonna know this is the thing to do when you've done it enough. You can go out in this woods every day for a week and not see a deer. When you start walking this way to get to the stand, all of a sudden you're going to start seeing deer. You're going to know, by golly, that is good advice. You're going to know. You're going to find out. But anyway, keep going right past that and up to here. Now, they've been crossing here too. Not as many, but there were fresh tracks crossing from this big hill here across this way where David got all those deer on this camera, camera cam. So, but anyway, I followed the deer trail in there and, and makes a little turn here. And this is a, used to be a good spot there. Uh, my buddy Silver, first year he hunted with us up there, got a really nice buck right there. This is the spruce bog, but over in the end here is a lot of elders and there's a lot of red osiers growing in there too. And deer like to be, feed in there. You know, in November they're feeding on browse. Beginning the, of the 8th of November, they're feeding on browse. They've got a dandy in there. I left him there and he got a big one. Well, then it goes around and it follows a little area here. It's kind of a low spot. There's a big hill up here. We call that Antler Mountain. And we've taken some nice bucks from Antler Mountain up on the other end here. But, uh, and I like the bed there along that edge, but a nice valley over there. But anyway, across there, but uh, when I got to this point, I was kind of interested, you know. They, there's a little low, little low valley here, and it's full of browse. And some years, boy, the deer have been feeding in there like crazy. So I was thinking I might be stopping here. It's on uh, my stool. I've got my stool on my back. You know, that's the thing about the stool. That stool gives me the ability to hunt. stand on anywhere I want, anytime. Doesn't matter where you are, what time of day it is. But if I decide I'm going to sit here, I can sit on my stool. I got a nice comfortable set. I'm not, you know, you don't find stumps or logs at the perfect spot when you're when you're depending on trying to find something to sit on, stand on, and at ground level. And uh, they don't always have good cover around them either to hide you. But anyway, so I, I was ready, thinking I might be stopping here if I see the right kind of deer sign here to get me excited. But I didn't. There was some tracks in there that looked kind of fresh, and they seemed to be going off and toward the south in that direction into the wind. So, or to, yeah, into the wind. Well, nothing there. So I went up across there. And then there's a bunch of evergreens along the edge here, on this little highland here. And I got down to about there. And then I, I was getting close. I knew it was getting close to where I wanted to sit. And I was coming up that big bare rock, <laughs> that outcropping. It's like a whale's back sticking up there in the, in the middle of the woods. Long one, quarter mile, almost quarter mile. Anyway, a long one like that. And you know, you can tiptoe across the top of that thing, just as quiet as can be. But the trouble is, you're completely skylighted <laughs> when you're walking on that rock. It's, you might be able to sneak over here without making any noise, but deer in the surrounding area, and they see your silhouette moving against the starlit sky, or maybe the sky's starting to glow out here in the east, you know, in anticipation of sunrise, it's starting to glow along the edge. They see this human <laughs> walking on there. That's not good. So uh, I kind of—I was thinking. I, I was kind of wondering. I was getting to this point. I remember this big evergreen. I stopped behind it and stood there. Finally stopped right there, trying to make up my mind now which way I'm going to go from here. Then right at that point, a a deer came out just a little ways from me, about 20 feet away from my right and went across in front of me and it didn't bound or run or snort or anything, just went across there, but quite a little bit fast. And of course it had to know uh, something was wrong here because here's this flashlight that wasn't shining out in the wood, it was down on the ground here. But it went by and I could plainly see it was a young doe. It wasn't a fawn, it was a yearling doe. And it was going across here now. Yearling does are in heat for 24 to 26 hours in November in this two-week 
breeding period in November. All the yearlings are in heat, as well as the older does. So, and I thought, well, now that's kind of interesting. The doe went there, and I wonder if there was a big buck around here. And uh, but I didn't see any at this point. I didn't see anything. I was kind of looking where the doe went. You know, I could see her tracks, real fresh, but no, no other tracks there. So anyway, I finally made up my mind, since there are deer around here, I'm going to go over to, to, the, over to the left here and go this way along the edge of this highland there. There's a whole bunch of big popple trees, great big tall ones, big, big climax popples, great big, and brush and a few evergreens along this deer trail going along the edge here like that. I said, I, I'd better go over there where I'm going to be well hidden. My satellite would be well hidden from a deer anywhere around the area. So I went over there and I got to the point where I was just going to turn. And there it was in a, a patch in front of me about, oh, I would say about 20 feet or so in diameter. All tracked up, just full, just deer tracks everywhere. And all the tracks were big ones. Uh, one set was at least four inches in line. Big deer. And the other one maybe a little less. But they had been fighting there. They were battling there. Two bucks had battled there this morning. I mean, maybe just within the hour before I came along. They had battled right here. And I was like, what the heck? You know, I just saw a doe, and here's a place where two bucks had been fighting. Were they fighting over this doe? And, but I was close enough, I could see the tracks, and I could see where they had both gone in this direction. Probably the winter, you went down in this direction, and it was alone going this way. And then it looked to me like the loser finally found it. I said, this, it sounds like, to, you know, the way it looks, there's a doe and heater on here. And it wasn't that yearling doe. They weren't hanging around the yearling doe. They were fighting here, but they went this way. And they didn't weren't bounding or trotting real fast. I hadn't frightened them coming to this point. They just walked this way. And that big one was dragging his hoofs from track to track. He was smelling pheromone coming at him from the south. And he was smelling. So he was dragging his hoofs from track to track, and now it was getting exciting. I said, I'm, you know, I, I meant to go here, but I was kind of wondering, maybe I won't be going that far. We'll see what happens. So I was going cautiously down this trail, steady, keep going, keep that cam, my, my flashlight pointing downward here, getting down here, and all of a sudden over on my left right here, Another big patch where two bucks had been fighting. And maybe the same two, you know, but they're fighting there. Maybe they're close to one another in size and strength. But they had battled there, right over there. And then I, I, was, I was looking at that, and then I saw something over here was black. You know, you could see in the in the snow, you know, there's a little bit of light cast in that direction. It was all black over there. And I should move my own. And it was a ground scrape, and it was freshly renewed, and there was black dirt pod widely over in that direction, you know. And that ground scrape was under a spruce tree here, a little bit closer examination. You know, the wind blowing from the ground scrape was under a spruce tree here. And I could see branches dangling, you know, in the halo of the light from that spruce tree. I said, boy, that big down the buck has just recently renewed that and mangled some branches there. And that was along this trail, along this trail here, going to the watering spot here. So here was where they had battled, and here, right here is where this ground creek was, right here. Well, nobody had to tell me what to do now. <laughs> I, I said, boy, I'm not going to get anywhere near, though. I didn't want to put any fresh human trail set anywhere close to that. So I was standing there looking, here's the place where the 
two bucks at plot right here, and the grouse crate was right over there. So I was kind of looking back here a little bit. There's a big spruce uh, popple tree trunk wall, oh, two and a half feet in armor, the base. And in front of it was a whole bunch of mountain maples. They're woody shrubs. They get maple like leaves on them. Oh, they dropped those leaves by this time, but it was thick with them. All kinds of them. And some hazels mixed in there and young evergreens as well. And out in front of this, between that popple tree and that ground scrape there. And so I'm tiptoeing a little bit to that big popple tree put my stool down in front of it, sat back on that, and with my rifle on my lap, pulled my head net down, so just, you know, just my eyes showing. I, just, I wear a camel blaze orange, so. And the, there's, here and there, all through that area, is these red oaks that hold their leaves all winter, and those red oaks are kind of orangey, cinnamon-colored leaves on them, and so. I think if I'm sitting really still and deer looks toward me, I'm just, he, he might think I'm, you know, he's going to think I'm just another red oak tree, a little one, or uh, because whitetails don't have receptors for colors in the red spectrum in their in their retinas and their eyes, I'm going to look white like the snow, I'm kind of broken up because of all the you know, tree trunks and branches in my camel clothing. So here I am sitting there very still and be not very noticeable. He wouldn't be able to see me down here, from here up to here. It would just look perfect, you know. Wasn't completely open channel in there. I'd have to move this way maybe a little or this way if I did see a buck come to that ground strip. Well, now there's a reason I expected to see a buck come to that ground strip. You know, we've talked about this before. Big bucks don't have time to be making or renewing ground scrapes while breeding is in progress. But this one came back, and I already knew there were two bucks in the area, and I think they were both there because there was a doe in this vicinity, and that big buck that was dragging his hoofs, was, uh, he made it plain. He could smell pheromone. He, there was a doe and heat in this vicinity. And these two bucks fought for the right to breed that doe. And another thing, the big dominant buck, he went over to that ground scrape and renewed it. And he was plenty mad because boy he had kicked dirt way across the snow when he did that. I was just really mad. Chased that buck away, beat him again in battle, and, and the buck probably didn't go very far. And because the poor thing was being attracted by that doe and heat pheromone in the air. That big buck, the other buck, knowing he was in danger, this guy was beating him up, but he couldn't go away because there's a doe and heat around here, and that pheromone makes it powerless for him. It comes from a warm doe, you know, it's fresh coming in the air. It wasn't something from the store-bought shelf, you know, uh, some other doe and heat kind of thing. This was the fresh stuff coming from a warm doe. It was not only the smell of the pheromone, but the smell of the doe was following it too. It was a strong smell, it smells like a doe. And it, it's in heat, obviously. <laughs> so all this was coming, and he just couldn't tear himself away from that thing. That big buck was furious about him. And so he was, he pawed dirt away there, demonstrating how mad he was. And he took his antlers and smashed some branches on that tree. And the doe went off to the right, apparently, while this was all going on. So. The, doe, the buck apparently followed the doe in that direction. I don't know where they went. I didn't want to go investigate tracks around that ground scrape. I didn't want to have any of my my trail scent there. That, you know, a human trail scent lasts up to four days in the woods. And I've proven over and over and over again, um, white tails and black bears <laughs> can determine how fresh that trail scent is when they smell it. And if it's fair, if it's really fresh, you know, only hours old or minutes old, it 
oh, that that potentially dangerous human, that, that predator walks on his hind legs, is close. That's about get, we better get out of here. Stay away from this area. So I didn't want any of that telling that book, this is a dangerous place. So I sat back. Now, when I sat back at this point, I had traveled a long way, you know, it was a mile from there to Mayor and maybe three quarter mile from here and then all this going around like this, getting back to this place, uh, probably another mile. Almost three miles walking on deer, mostly this was easy, that was an old logging trail, but this was all deer trails getting there. Deer trails, I knew, I knew them well because of, I now I scouted that year, but many years before that, I knew these trails, I could probably almost follow them with my eyes closed. But, but anyway, I knew where I was going. I was almost three miles in darkness with my flashlight. Now, I didn't mark these trails because I knew them. If I had a relatively new trail, I don't know if I, I'll mark them with a fluorescent patch. But I knew these trails very well. And this one here, so I knew them really well. So, at this point, based on previous knowledge and bucks i would taken in previous years under similar circumstances, in November, coming on a ground scrape that's freshly renewed, and especially when we are geez, dirt scattered away over there. <laughs> this was a mad, dominant breeding buck. And there's, it's with a doe, and that when you find one of those, that usually means it was with a doe, and this is fresh, and they're really close by, unless you screwed up getting there. You know, it made it easy for them to detect you. If I had gone across that bare rock, they'd probably, they probably would have got me before I even got close to that spot. So I didn't go that way. I went where I had good cover. I didn't make noise and walking in snow, but it wasn't crunchy, squeeze, squeeze. That kind of snow it was powdery stuff. But anyway, got in there and and did everything right. So I didn't alarm deer anywhere along the way, and I certainly didn't alarm any there. I didn't hear any snorting or bounding going on in the darkness there. So I sat down and stood. And when I sat down, I was darn excited. My odds of taking a big buck this morning are so good, I just couldn't hardly stand it. So, pretty soon, it was getting light, first light, you know, that band of light along the east line was getting bigger and bigger, and the, snow, and the breeze was still coming in my direction, and, and uh, so I was there. I, was, I expected to see some deer pretty soon, and I was sitting there, and, and so, Person, it was light, legal shooting time, and I, you know, I had looked. I was looking off in one direction like this, and then I turned back, and I'll be there. Here's this big eight pointer, rubbing scalp musk on bow of that tree above his cross grip, right there, right there, twenty yards away. There he was, and no idea was there. He's rubbing up there like that. I'll be. I got my gun up, and now there was some little luck involved here. I was like, geez, this is a big buck. And I got my gun up like that, like that, you know, and his head is sideways like this. And I'm going to shoot him right in the spine, you know, right below the head, drop him in his tracks. I, I love those spine neck shots. So I, I took aim without much time. I didn't take much time, and pow. And he just stood there. What, what, what in the world happened? My bullet must have hit a branch of some kind. Darn seven millimeter magnums. I mean, they hit a little branch and they can ricochet or explode. I've had one explode right in front of a deer and hit the deer in five places and I still got him. He was the biggest buck I ever took. But it didn't touch the deer. And Ah, oh, it was flabbergasted. And he turned, and sometimes when that happens, I've had it happen several times over the years, the deer apparently thought he just heard, a, heard thunder, a crack of thunder. 
and just stands there and looks around, but he can't, can't be sure. And he kind of—he was looking, and he turned his head. He was looking in my direction. And I thought, well, he can't see my body, so I, I, there I sat while he's looking right toward me. I eased the bolt open, and I didn't like that bullet go click and fly. I took it out before the bolt was all the way back, and then I went back a little bit and held that that. The bullet down below that was ready to pop up, and he kept it from popping. And then I got the head, I allowed the head to come up the, you know, the point. And then I start moving the bolt slowly shut, and the bullet went into the chamber, drain out this without any sound. And then I pushed the, the bolt forward and turned it down really silent. All the while, it was looking right at me. And I was thinking, you know, he probably thinks I'm just a grouse if he's... I hadn't moved that any way that I thought he could see me. I said, when my head moves, that might be... Or when I bring my gun up, he might see something move over there. I wonder, is that a grouse? You know, I'm saying that could be. So then I started getting my gun up again, and I took aim. And this time I was going to shoot right in the center of his throat patch. Right there, by instantly fatal shot. And then I looked a little more carefully about what might be in the way, and I'll be darn, there were several of those darn Mount Maple stems right there between me and the deer. So, oh my, I so said, what am I going to do? So I started leaning a little bit to the right, leaning that, and oh, there, I got an open hole there. You know, with an accurate rifle, a good scope, how much of a shooting line do you need? I just needed something about three inches wide. <laughs> And I got over there, and there, perfect. Pull the trigger. It was just deathly quiet. I didn't see the deer go down. I just, but he wasn't there anymore. I didn't hear him running away. And I said, did I get him? I, I, I imagine I got him, but I wasn't sure. And I was getting kind of anxious, you know. So I got, finally I got up. I waited about five minutes, and I got up. Went tiptoeing over there. There he was. <laughs> it put laying right there, right in the middle of that ground scrape. And there, you'll see a picture of it. Me there, and you see my stool there with him, you know, and I'm a pretty happy guy <laughs> with that big buck. He was a big eight pointer. Yeah, nice deer. You know, not record book, but. And, you know, and, and I didn't even have him mounted. Uh, I didn't have text every time with that deer. I probably should have, but I didn't. But anyway, you'll see another picture here. Uh, uh, my grandson Tyler got his first buck, wonderful shot. We'll talk all about that another time and how he got it and why and that kind of thing. And we got them both on my my garden wagon <laughs> that's supposed to hold a thousand pounds. We had those two big bucks in there. Look at them there. Now, the buck he got was kind of different. You know, it was obviously a huge, big, down the buck, big, tough animal. But he didn't have huge antlers. And you know, that's the problem we have in the country. We got some big deer, but we don't necessarily get big, big antlers to go with it. And, uh, one of the biggest ones I got up, another one, it was an eight-pointer. And there again, I didn't have it on it, but holy cow, it was big deal. You'll see a picture of that hanging in a tree, and I'm right next to it, there's like an elk hanging there. So anyway, but all I did that day, all the knowledge I knew about white tails, all the knowledge I knew about the country, that whole area because of my scouting, and all the knowledge you knew about how deer react and why and what that deer sign meant, you know, and I could depend on it, it all worked perfectly. All that stuff in the pitch dark, getting to that spot, and doing it in a way that doesn't alarm deer along the way, including that, that yearling doe that went past me. It was, that wasn't a, really a greatly alarmed deer. Using my flashlight carefully, keeping that beam down, never shining it out there like that. Wanted to look to see if I see any glowing eyes of deer. Never do that, ever. But anyway, I did all that just right that morning, and then ended up with me taking a nice buck. And that's 
the kind of stories I, that go with hunting mature whitetails, mature bucks. Yeah. And that's the kind of bucks that we, and <laughs> that we hunt up in the area we hunt, and things work out just right. I've taken several other bucks under similar circumstances, finding a fresh antler robin hunting nearby. And we'll talk about some of those in the future, but uh, from here, we'll, we're going to take different bucks, and there's always something different that we did, and something different we recognized that it made it possible to take this big buck, and bucks my, my sons have taken as well, putting it all together. And so that's how it counts, you know? So, uh, and the weather and wind direction. Wind direction is always the first thing my sons and I want to know when we wake up in the morning. What direction is the wind blowing today? And sometimes, sometimes, we'll do something <laughs> different. Uh, even when the wind direction is adverse and make it work out. So I'll tell you about that, maybe next time. But I'll pick out another buck here, and next time I see you, we'll go through the whole operation again. So you, you get, you start to learn how to put these things together in a way that it ends up enabling you to take a big buck. So how was that? Wasn't that fun this morning out there in the woods? <laughs> yeah, and you see the pictures, you know, and you'll shake your head and see that it really worked, and it does. And it's not just. It's not luck. It, it's very good hunting is what it is. And, you know, knowing what these deer signs mean, knowing how to, how to walk in the woods when you're going to a stand site, knowing how to pick a stand site right away if you need one, and things like that. So knowing, being really careful of the trail scent, <laughs> in wind direction, airborne scent, being really careful about that as well. All these things that have to come together for you to take a big buck. If you just depend on luck, that you aren't going to take many big, really big bucks in your lifetime. But if you do these things, you can take a decent buck every year. We, I don't take one every year, but most years. But the, and it's getting to be difficult because the, our deer population is so low where they are because of the wolves situation, but um, but it, it's still great hunting. It's fun to be able to do this. It's fun to succeed no matter how tough the circumstances might be. But boy, I've got lots of different situations. Like I said, you hardly ever take, repeat, <laughs> uh, doing the same thing at the same spot every year. You know, most often, each big buck you take it, something was different about it, something you did, some conclusions you made, the things you did to get ready will be different, but it will be tailored for hunting that particular buck. And so we'll do more of this. So now just remember that now. now you're starting to get the idea here and all that. You can't just send one tree stand the whole hunting scene and expect to be taking big bucks every year. That, that's clearly not the way to do it. You got to you got to be versatile. You got to be adaptable, and um, and and skilled, and take lots of precautions. All kinds of precautions. And some of the I, one of the things I was going to talk to you about today is, you know, today you found out what why I hunted where, where I did, why I sat down, because I found certain things that make that particular spot mature buck effective. I mean. Mature buck effective, and every place my boys and I sit and stand on it is mature buck effective for some reason. And there's about eight things that will make a stand site mature buck effective. Well, not necessarily all eight, sometimes three of the eight. <laughs> but there's some things that make a stand site uh, uh, where you're more likely to take a big buck than anywhere else. And one of them I want to just mention here is that it's a stand site you've never used before. Never ever. A spot that a buck doesn't have any, uh, any reason to believe there could be 
a dangerous human waiting in ambush there. Stand sites you've been using in the past aren't near as good as stand sites that have never been used before when you're hunting big bucks. So, boy, do we love stand sites never used before that have some of these additional things that tell you this is a mature buck effective stand site. So, keep that in mind. <laughs> So now you're starting to get an idea what this is all about, aren't you? Yeah. So next time we'll take another buck and we'll go through the procedure and it'll be different. It won't be the same thing. So you'll see that. Okay. Well, thanks guys for watching. And, and listen, if you haven't got your book yet, you know, I know we've all had to sit on our bank accounts because of, we don't know how long this COVID-19 thing was going to last, but it looks like well, you know, lots of parts of the country, we're finally getting to the end of it. It's not over, but we're getting there. So, uh, if you can swing it, get your book. And uh, your your 10th edition went to honor on that. There's no book like it in the world. And no book anywhere in the world has the information in it that you're going to, you know, like what we've been talking about, like that this book has. Nobody's done this kind of hunting-related research before. I'm, I'm the first one. And so, if you want to be able to hunt big bucks uh, successfully, you, you really need this book. You really do. So you get all of this squared away in your mind so you can do it in the future. So do that one of these days. If you can, like I say, if you can swing it. Of course, you can't use food money for the kids and things like that, but you, someday you just got to be able to get this book. And uh, so be sure to do that. And then before you go, be sure you hit the subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. And you'll be notified the minute I post another uh, YouTube presentation like this one. And you're going to be, you got these exciting, you know, seminars coming up where we're taking individual bucks and how we got them. Uh, these are going to be fun to watch. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get, subscribe. And then also hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed what you heard today. And I can't imagine you didn't enjoy it, <laughs> learning what you've learned now. So, uh, do that for me, will you? And th these really make a difference on my future as a speaker on YouTube. You know, they determine whether I'll be able to keep doing this for a long time. So, I want to be able to do that. You know, at my age, <laughs> 85 now, you know, uh, at my age, uh, you just never know uh, how long I'll be able to keep doing this. But as long as I have this knowledge, and I want to pass it on to you and other hunters so you can enjoy the kind of buck hunting uh, my three boys and I have enjoyed, and now my grandsons as well, for many, many years. And so these are all proven things. They work. It really works. So do that. Get your book. And so you, because, you know, you're going to be out in the woods and you remember what, you know, some of these seminars that I've presented. There's sure a bunch of them now. <laughs> and, you know, you, you can go back to the beginning and go through all it, 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 The knowledge doesn't change. It, it's all there for you. But anyway, when you're up in deer camp and you think, well, now what do you say? What do you do? Well, if you got the book, you always got a reference right there in deer camp to check on so you can do things properly during the hunting season. So, with that, again, thanks guys, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.